Yeah, I've been listening to your your podcast. I'm curious, what made you start um, this particular series that you have? Well, I started Pass the Power with Paige Parker in March of this year, but the podcast had been brewing in my mind for a couple of years because I was writing for the Straits Times and I was doing a monthly column, which I really enjoyed. But I also knew that a lot of people who follow me on social media are not read, reading the newspaper. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like with the Straits Times, I felt a little bit like I was preaching to the choir. And I thought how, you know, a po- maybe a podcast is the answer. And then as the, you know, we were stuck at home and I had more people writing me saying, I love your positive your positivity on Instagram. Um, I love that, you know, you're finding inspiration while we're all stuck at home. And I just started thinking that people need conversations of hope. And it sounds so hokey, but my daughters will tell you I am 100% hokey. (laughs) I do think that mindset is a huge part of life. I know there are times when mindset cannot win, but there are most of the times in life, if we have a positive mindset, I think that truly can shape things in our favor. And so I wanted to have these conversations of hope where I talk with uh, the thought leaders. And because we are stuck in Singapore, they've been specific to Singapore. And, and, um, you know, people like the head of the stock exchange, the head of the Asian Civilizations Museum, um, the head of Economic Development Board, but also to find out from them about their failures. Hmm. Uh, If they had a tiger mom growing up, (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the things that that make these people human and real. Yeah, and I wanted to have those conversations with them, and then pass it on, pass the power, so that maybe somebody can go, "Wow, the head of EDB, Swan Jim Bay, came from Malaysia. He came by himself at age twelve. He actually did an internship uh, when he got out of school to be a fashion designer. You wow. know, uh, his parents wanted him to be uh, a lawyer." He became a doctor. He ditched that for EBBs. You know, so just to hear that like serendipity plays such a big part in our lives and and that there 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 should be hope. And so that was a bit that was the big reason that I started Past the Power was because I felt that podcasts are the future. You obviously realize that because you know you've been doing your podcast. And I think people are, need to multitask these days. And so I know when I walk my dog, I'm constantly listening to podcasts, even in the shower. So it's something, even when I'm cooking, it's something that we can, you know, take nuggets from the podcast, hopefully put them into our lives and maybe have an aha moment or maybe even have a, wow, if that happened to her, then I, it's not so bad for me. Yeah. And just kind of to, to reaffirm people that life is good and life's going to be okay. Yeah. That, you know, that's such an interesting point that you made and, it also makes me think because since you do write for the Straits Times as well, you know, I think there's, you know, when you have a medium like the pod, a, a podcast, you know, it's a very passive form of absorption, so to speak, right? You know, sometimes you wonder if the main point gets missed or, you know, it's it's one of those things where you wonder whether the, the parts of the story you want people to to hear are the ones they actually take away from it as compared to if you're reading, which is a more active um, way of, you know, understanding the story. But I'm curious, what do you think about that? But part of the problem with that is that a lot of people I want to 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 be inspired and to 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 feel better about life. Yeah. They're not reading the straight mm-hmm. story. Yeah. I mean, if we look at the numbers, I think we all know, um, you know, nobody's reading newspapers anymore. We all get our information through social media, through um, podcasts. I mean, you know, even people are getting it on Facebook, right? So, so I think it's, imp- I think the podcast is important. And if they don't get the main point that we think is important and they get something else, it's okay. Yeah. They're going to walk away from a 35, 45 minute conversation with something. And, and, and whether they think this sucks, I'm never listening again. I mean, I didn't learn anything to, wow, I had no idea, you know, Professor Tommy Coe is such a feminist. This is amazing. You know, so, so I think people take what they need and we can't be everything to everybody. And I, yeah, I, in my opinion, I think that the, the podcast probably touches more than the written word. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I suppose you're right. You know, historically, I mean, the written form isn't the most popular medium for content. So we re- it's really just a minority. So yeah, I mean, it's good. You know, I really enjoy your podcast as well. And so to your book, you know, I think one of the things, I think I mentioned it in the uh, in, in our email correspondence as well. Like one of the things, you know, as I took away when I was reading your book was that you know, certain certain chapters could have been stories on their own, like an entire book on their own, you know, and it's something that I, I, I kind of wish it was in some ways, but I'm curious as a writer, were there any experiences you felt could have been a book on its own? Oh, sure. And and just so you know, this was my second version because when we still lived in New York, we uh, my husband and I moved to Singapore in 2007 before moving, and we came home from our trip around the world. Well, first, let me tell the people who don't know what we're talking about is I I drove around the world with my husband for three years at the turn of the millennium. We visited 116 countries. Uh, It was 1,101 days because I promise I was counting. It was heaven. It was hell. It was as good as it could get. It was as bad as it could get, you know, and, and then when we got home from this trip, we actually have a Guinness world record for doing this which is very, very cool. But my husband likes to joke, it doesn't pay the rent. (laughs) So, so, you know, it was this epic trip. And then once we came back, I became pregnant, pregnant with my first child. And my husband's book came out while I was pregnant. And I was, you know, I'd read through many of his drafts, and I was reading it. And I was like, this is not my story. I want my daughter to know my version of our trip around the world, because I didn't visit one stock exchange. I went to the women's market, to the co-ops, you know, I mean, I, it, I had vastly different interests. So my story was different. And so then I sat down to write my book, to write my manuscript so that no matter what, my daughter would one day be able to read my story and it wouldn't be lost in his. And so it was just before we moved to Singapore, I finished the book and I had an offer from a publisher to take it straight. And it was about 410 pages, which is way too long for a book. But I had an offer to publish it to paperback. And this was so far ago. This was, um, what, 2006? Oh, wow. So Nobody went back, straight right? to paperback. Do you know what I mean? That was like, that was like an insult. And I was like, <laughs> you know, no, thank you. No, thank you. And then soon after, we ended up moving to, to Singapore, which is another story in itself. Uh, and then once we arrived, I became pregnant with my second child. I worked very hard to get her into the local school system here. Um, you know, and I immersed myself trying to understand Singapore. And it was a little while before I went back to that first book. Uh, I had lunch with a friend who's a writer and he said to me, you should at least bind it because even if you don't publish it, she will have the physical book. So I said, you know, that's a great idea. So I I read it and I said, this is good, but I can make it better. (laughs) So then I spent two years rewriting this book. And so now I think it's, uh, let me see, I think it's like 226 pages. Yeah. Um, And so I cut a huge amount, but I had had, what, 10 years time? So, So it was so much easier to kind of pull the nuggets that I thought were really important. And I also tried to put more of a female centric theme going throughout also focusing on my evolution as a woman, because when I went into the, to the trip, I was very, very naive. And I came home a woman of the world. Then I was in Singapore for you know many years before the book came out. So, I mean, a lot had happened in my life to give me perspective, to look back on that trip. So the, 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 the story of me, um, is is a whole nother uh, book on its own, I feel like. Uh, being even more specific to the women I met who truly touched me, um, you know, like um, Vitalia and, um, you know, the, the young girl in, the, in Calcutta, the young prostitute who was 13 years old. I mean, just the women who I still see them, uh, you know, 21 years later, I can still see them in my mind. I think those women have a story, have a book. I think the the relationship between uh, my husband, Jim, and I certainly could have far more said. Yeah. Uh, you know, deciding to move to Singapore, why that came about. So I think there are a lot of books that could happen from this. 
But at this point in my life, the book that I want to write is actually moving to Asia and educating my children you know, in the local school in Singapore, going to a Chinese centric school, being the only Caucasians in that school, the only mm-hmm. girls with blue eyes, you know, kind of the Caucasian tiger mom story. Yeah. And so that's something that I'm thinking about. And, um, you know, B is my youngest daughter is only 13. So it's a little early, you know, we need to kind of, I guess, let her progress until, you know, she goes to university to really be able to tell the true story. But that's, that's the next story that I want to tell in a book. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be a, an, an, an interesting one, you know, cause it's not the most common of stories, you know, especially here in Singapore, but There's I think so many things going on with that, because I have a daughter who's 18, who's about to graduate from boarding school in the UK and her name is Hilton and she stayed here. She left two years ago. So she stayed until um, sixth form um, until the last two years. And at this point she feels that we have stripped her of her American identity by bringing her to Asia at age wow. four, you know, rearing her here. And um, she's actually going back to America. She's going to Columbia University in the fall. It's her the only school she wanted to go to, even though we made her apply to all these schools. And um, but it's the it's her dream school. And so it's it's kind of ironic that we left New York to bring them to Asia and she's going back to Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she can regain that, that American identity there. <laughs> and in 20 years, I think they'll thank us for, for you know, rearing them here. But sometimes when you're a teenager, it, it doesn't matter what your parents do. They're yeah. Wrong. They're wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's uh, something you said, you know, uh, earlier on. That, that really struck me and I think it's a good it's a good segue into the the questions I wanted to ask as well and that's you know I, I'm curious to to kind of get your perspective on how you change through that process and and a and a, a good example of that that I had was you know you in the book you spoke really about how in your 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 formative years and your growing up years you really saw the world in black and white and eventually you started to appreciate the world, especially during those traveling periods where you really started to appreciate those shades of gray. So like, how, how do you see the world now? You know, what guides you? What's your moral compass? And are you, uh, are you more forgiving to the, the bad, the vices, the terrible in the world? Absolutely. Definitely forgiving. Far more forgiving. And I think the trip also makes me Anytime I feel sorry for myself, I just say, Paige, stop it. You are so blessed. And that trip taught me that. There's no way for someone, I grew up in a town with 50,000 people in North Carolina, which is a Southern state in the US. And I, you know, I went to local school, then I went to a, a private university and, and I kind of lived, I think we had one Jewish family in my town. Um, we had... Um, probably 50 50 mix of uh blacks and whites but there was literally a a railroad track that divided the counties and now people are living on both sides but at that time it was kind of divided the white and the black Um, and i was just incredibly naive because life was good and then you go and you travel through places and you understand that women don't have access to education. Women don't have freedom of movement. Women don't have the right to a passport. And you realize that you are so privileged and how it's so unfair. It's birthright. It's who you're born to is so much a big part of it. I talk about that in the book. So it really makes you question a lot of where you came from and what you can do in your small little way to try to lift people up. And I think that's, you know, certainly the trip did that for me. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't have a lot of money to give or I don't have much time. And the thing is, is it doesn't matter if you have a lot or a little, if we all do something good to help, then we move in the right way. Having the defeatist mindset kills everything. So we, we have to believe that a little bit, a little bit, a little bit is all going to add up to, to greatness. And it can. 
It's like tomorrow is World Oceans Day. Mm-hmm. And I was looking, I was doing some um, research on this and 80% of the pollutants in the ocean come from inland, come from us. That's us. We're doing that. Yeah. You know? And and all these women who are insecure and, and don't believe they're equal to men, that's us. And all those women who want to starve themselves so they're thin, that's us. You know, people who want to lighten their skin, that's us. It's all created by us. So we just have to be so conscious of, of our actions and just to know that they have severe consequences. Yeah. And it's such a it's such a good point. And I mean, the the story that really stuck to me was really the the one of the was it the Uzbek or the the Kazakhstan prostitute, I believe, was the one and how she told you that, you know, she's almost desensitized to it, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, it, how, yeah. I, I, I mentioned her. She's the one who ultimately in the end said, we're all actors. We're yeah. all, we're all playing. And I just play my part in the role. Yeah. When I read that, you know, I was thinking to myself, that must be the most common yet saddest way to describe you know, like a vast population of human beings, you know, because yeah, maybe, I mean, her circumstances are far worse than a regular blue collar, white collar worker, but that desensitization, because you're just experiencing a means to an end is, I don't know, it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, regardless of your circumstance in the country or the social, the social lottery that you're afforded, you know, that seems to be quite common, but when you when you experience something like that, you know, and and that's why I brought up the the shades of gray points. Like, do you do you come from a point now if you experience someone like her again? Would you say to her, "Hey, you can change your circumstance," or do you just appreciate the story for what it is? I appreciate the story, probably, but I do think that part of the the issue is that mindset that she has adapted is a safety mechanism. I mean, it's, it's her way of, of dealing with her reality. And before I went on the trip, I would say prostitution is absolutely wrong. And, you know, after going around the world and seeing it everywhere, um, especially in Russia, um, lots, we saw lots there, uh, not to offend any Russians, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But, but, you know, when we were in Amsterdam and we went to Yab Yam where, um, you know, it's legalized and there's testing and, and uh, even when we were in Calcutta, when they were trying to get the prostitutes to all, uh, they were forming a union so they would all wear condoms. I mean, it's going to happen. So how do we make sure the women are safe? Yeah. In a perfect world, do we want it to stop? Do we want women to have access to education so they can get proper jobs? Yes. Is that going to take a long time? Yes. In the meantime, let's try to keep them safe from disease. Um, but and, until we change so many mindsets of people who you know, don't think that women need education, um, prostitution will continue. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with any of them, by the way? I have one uh, very good friend, Anadia, who I met. um, Actually, I met her when we were in Almaty, and she now lives in um, L.A., and her husband has since died. And he actually died when we still lived in the U.S., and I went out for the funeral. But So she became a very good friend. Um, A few other uh, kind of pen pals. The guy who helped me go up Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. Um, has helped me twice more. Wow. I've it three times now. Yeah. So we, uh, up the same mountain or s- s- somewhere else? Uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa, uh, but different route the the second two times. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I think that's a it's a great segue to to the question on on contentment and you know the search for something better. Um, there, uh, there, there were many, there were many examples of this, you know, it through through the book. But I suppose the one that 
that resonated with me was probably the one about your mom because you know i guess by relation right and you you said like you know you don't know if she had had another life uh, a, a different husband or something like that her wanderlust might have been fulfilled and so i'm curious like especially now that you have daughters as well like how do you help them and maybe yourself as well navigate um you know being content but at the same time you know trying to push the boundary towards something ideal and something better how does that work for you it's interesting because um, I'm actually um, re reading uh, Think Like a Monk right now, which is fabulous. I love Jay. Um, but as much as I wonder about my mother and if she had someone who was more adventuresome in her life, I also, and I think I mentioned this in the book, I envy my father for the contentment he has. And it's I mean, I hate to say it because it sounds terrible, but it's not a lack of wanderlust. It's just a contentment. He's really happy in his little town, having breakfast at the same place, you know, seeing the same people, you know, going to the beach or the mountains every once in a while. But I mean, not being supremely thirsty for more and better, right? And most of us, as we struggle with contentment, it's because we're struggling for things that we want that for many of us, if we get them, they're really not going to bring contentment. It's just things that we think we want, right? Um, and, and how many wealthy people do you know who are not happy, right? So I am, I, I tell my daughters that I, I do think that Focusing on contentment is incredibly important, but I do think it comes with a little more perspective. I mean, I think for most 13 and 18 year olds, they need to be um, high strung and driven and not, you know, falling in with a crowd in the US where they're all smoking marijuana and they're very content. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, you can be content by working hard. Yeah. Aisha Khanna talked about that on the podcast. Um, she's an AI whiz. And, and um, you know, I don't know why it gets a bad rap, you know, working hard, because working hard can bring contentment. Is there anything better than, than really striving to do something and then you get it, right? Um, but I do think that it's that kind of thing that brings you contentment more than for most people who think they want a Ferrari or think they want to be able to afford a bigger HDB not sure the things are going to bring contentment. Yeah. What, what does contentment mean for you then? And I must say that through the world, and people, people say that it's terrible when I say this, but so many people who we saw on the road, again, we were in 116 countries, 37 countries in Africa. So many people we saw on the road were completely content, living in the moment and, and with far less than most of us have in Singapore. So I guess contentment would be, um, uh, you know, having that peace with yourself Yeah. so that, that, you know, you're being the best version of you and doing what you're meant to do and what you should do and taking care of yourself, but also, you know, kind of feeding the soul of others along the way. Cause I think that's really important. Um, but just being true to you and not letting others drive you. And I think because I'm 52, you know, the older you get, the more the you know, the more you think about these things, and 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 you just cannot let the external factors and the external noise drive you to what you think is contentment. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I think it's so true, and I think I can't speak for any other country, but I think it is a very Singaporean thing to 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 think and plan for tomorrow at the expense of today. And I don't know whether it's culture or, or it's upbringing or, or anything in between nature and nature, but yeah, it is a very Singaporean thing. And, and that's kind of one of the reasons why, you know, especially with this, this podcast, you know, as you speak with more people, you really get to learn like what, what it means to just be fulfilled in the moment, in the day. Don't, 
Don't you think the last year has taught all of us that so much? I mean, you've seen people step forward and help the elderly, help the healthcare workers, send food to friends. I mean, people have really stepped up. And I, I feel like, you know, couples have reconnected. My husband had been traveling all the time. I mean, it's like the longest we've been together, right? <laughs> and, and I told one of my best friends, I said, you know, Maisie, we, we still really like each other. It's, it's good, you know? And so this year has allowed people to, to reconnect, um, families to be together like they never would before, um, to, to have, I guess, the luxury of time. Yeah. This, because we're all so time starved, right? I, that's how we started. Before we started recording, I was saying, you know, I just feel time starved. And, and to have the luxury of time to be able to sit and read with a family or sit and do a jigsaw puzzle. Mm-hmm. I mean, a jigsaw puzzle, nobody does that, right? You don't yeah. have time. <laughs> and uh, and it, it makes you really understand that that time is a luxury. So one interesting story about time is when we were driving around Africa, we did 37 countries, it took us nine months. And by the time we reached South Africa, uh, we'd gone down the West Coast by the time we got to South Africa and we got, you know, and I, we'd been staying in places that cost, you know, a dollar, 50 cents a night, um, some with no running water and some, you know, only cold showers and that kind of thing. So by the time we got to South Africa and it was a nice hotel and, you know, um, Table Mountain and restaurants and things to do, and there's so much to do, you realize you're, you're doing it. You're just doing, 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 as opposed to sitting at Table Mountain and absorbing like you'd been doing the whole way down the West Coast, because there's so little to do other than live in the moment. And so we have to also be very conscious of the fact that we can't overplan. Um, you know, I'm very type A, and I think we always just want to, you know, for me, I always want to have my finger in the socket. I want to be charged. I want to be on. And sometimes you just need to turn off and really just appreciate where you are and and read that book and enjoy the cup of tea and. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. reminding myself this now. <laughs> yeah, good. One other time is when we were in Sudan and we were stuck in the Sahara. Uh, we were stuck at the border with Egypt for three weeks because we couldn't drive across because uh, there was fighting going on. So we had to get a boat, get our car, take it up the Nile. And for the three weeks, I'd already read all my books. So I was rereading my books. Um, you know, I was covered head to toe because we were in a Muslim country. It was uh, probably about 39, 40 degrees every day and no running water, no toilets. Um, and I met this woman, Raja, and she uh, would make me eggs in the morning. So I had eggs and, you know, she couldn't speak English. I couldn't um, speak her language. And, but we, and we just spent time and we enjoyed each other. She actually was a Christian. She took me to see her church. She was so proud to show me. But one day she gave me a pomegranate and I took it home and I had a Swiss army knife you know, I, I cut it open and I ate seed by seed. My nails were stained <laughs> and, and who, I bet no one listening has ever cut open pomegranate and eat it, eaten it seed by seed because you just don't have the time for that, right? That is a, a, a luxury to be able to do that. And some people are saying it's not a luxury. You could be spending your time making money, doing something more, but no, sometimes to sit and savor that fruit is contentment. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, how, how, how do you, you know, and, and plus, you know, you say you're type A as well. How do you intentionally kind of slow things down and, and give yourself a bit of peace of mind? And, and that? I do, I, I do quite a bit of reading like the, I, I read um, Adam Grant's Think Again. Recently, I'm reading um, Think Like a Monk. I do try to, uh, to be conscious of it. Yeah. Um, and also when, because my husband is also very type A headstrong. And when we had children, I had to kind of take it down a couple of notches because for better or worse, he wasn't going to. And, and you cannot have two type A's constantly kind of at each other when you have children, or I guess you can, but I wasn't going to. And so I only kind of started, you know, getting upset if it was something that really mattered. And I also started letting him think that many of my ideas were his ideas. <laughs> so, you, you know, you, you, you learn how to deal with the type A and, and um, 
I, I thrive best when I'm overscheduled, but I also mean know that that means that I, that means that maybe I'm not really doing the best at each thing because I yeah. am overscheduled. So yeah. being, I think it's being conscious of it and, and trying to be true to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have all the answers. I'm, I'm, I'm 52 and a work in progress. I promise. <laughs> and we all, right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you spoke about your husband, you know, traveling three years together is no joke. And the first year, I mean, technically, you guys were like still dating and getting to know each other. Engaged. Right? We were engaged. Engaged, yeah. So, I mean, you know, what did, what do you think, what did you learn from Jim during that period? And what did you think he learned from you that, I, I, that probably resulted in them becoming, in, in Jim becoming better and you becoming a better person, yeah. So the question is, what did I learn the first year before I married him? Um, well, I guess maybe we can compound it to all three years, but maybe, but but I think maybe before that, I think I'm more curious about what Jim learned from you, mm -hmm. you know, that made him appreciate you the most. Right. And then vice versa. Well, I think... Uh... I, there are different kinds of people and some are able to kind of explode. And then the next day it's, I love you, honey, you're the best. And that, you know, they've lost their temper and then the next day they're fine. And then there are other people like me who you explode on me the next day, I'm still holding it and I'm still really unhappy and don't call me honey. So that was, uh, uh, and, it's, and when you're on the road with somebody crossing borders and, you know, not knowing where you're going to sleep, not knowing what you're going to eat, this was before, you know, like good GPS and, and there was no like guide for us to figure out, you know, what we were going to do. Um, it, it's taxing and it's stressing. So it was far more difficult on the personal relationship side than the physical side. And about three months into the trip, um, some men kind of accosted me at the border in Georgia. And I was distraught. And Jim was like, what do you expect? They're men. And I, that night I had a big think. And I was like, do I go home? Because this man has no sympathy and no empathy. And can I do this trip with him? And I realized I wanted to keep going for me. And, and... I didn't want to quit because I, I really loved this learning journey that I was on. And so I decided to, to stay and not let Jim be the catalyst, but let the world be the catalyst for me to continue on the trip. And I think we all have flaws and it's learning that it, it's, it's kind of deciding whether or not the positives outweigh. And if those flaws are something that you can accept, I mean, some, you know, if you're beaten, <laughs> you don't accept it, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it was kind of a, a massive learning curve. And I always tell people, if you can do three years on the road with somebody, the rest of your life is a breeze because it's so intense. Imagine every single day, you only have one person, you know, and you're in a small little car. Yeah. And you're getting lost. And, and when you're in the desert, you're not running the air conditioner because you don't want the car to, to you know, run down. So, and it's hot and there's sand and like, you haven't had a bath in five days and you hate him. <laughs> <laughs> there's no airports, you can't leave. And then, you know, you meet somebody and there's this, this, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and something great happens and it feeds your soul. So you want to keep going and, and, and traveling on. And people were so good to us everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess what I learned most about Jim was that he has a really big heart and I think sometimes it's hard for him to show as opposed to me, I have a really big heart and I like show it effusely, you know? Um, and what I think Jim would say um, for him, he kind of never had wanted to have children. And for me, it was a deal breaker and that I, I knew I wanted to have children. And so when we became pregnant, I mean, it was a bit of a, you know, rolling the dice on if it was going to work because I didn't know how he would feel having a child. He's an older father. And um, as soon as uh, Hilton was born, um, he was a changed man. And unbelievably grateful 
that I had brought this facet into his life, which it had escaped him for decades. Yeah. So I think that would be kind of the, the thing that he would say changed him the most through me would be being a father. And he's um, a very good father. Yeah. I remember that part of the book as well. That must have, uh, it's, it's interesting to really see someone's very strong opinion about something just change just by seeing it happen, you know, and in this case, the birth of Hilton. Well, the thing is, is he was like, as we were going through the process, he was like, yeah, sure, it's going to be fine. But, you know, that doesn't mean that a, a man is going to be committed as a father. Yeah. And I don't know if you listen to the podcast with Hilton and Jim, but one of the things that she talked about, it was the the finale of my first episode of my first uh, season. And she talked that she she said she's so proud because he's a very hands on um, and he's a very in touch father. And and for so many men, they're not some, yeah. but they don't have the, the luxury of time because they're working because Jim's an older father. He was able to ride them to school in the morning on the bike. Um, pick them up from school, you know, uh, really have meals with them, really spend a lot of time and be a very attentive father. So, so far, so good. He's a good father. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> um, you know, having traveled for three years, you know, and experienced so many countries, people, culture, do you think there was, was there anything you wish you had experienced but didn't get a chance to? Well, it's interesting because we were on the road for three years and it sounds like such a long time, but we weren't anywhere long enough. You know, it's like you dip your toe into each place. I think the longest we were in China for uh, six, seven weeks, we were in Russia three and a half months just because it has what, 11 time zones. Yeah. So massive, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess it would probably be, I would say to someone that, yes, it's quite something. It's a feat to travel around the world, but maybe to choose eight places to spend, you know, your three years. So you really can know those places a little bit better and with more depth and maybe appreciate and understand them. Because I did try to read and, and learn about a place before I went. I'll never forget being in at the Blue Mosque um, in Istanbul. And there were some American tourists there who you know, giggling and loud inside the mosque and, you know, didn't want to cover their heads. And I mean, it's just, it, it's a part of when you go, you respect where you are. Right. Yeah. And so if you, if you aren't educated about a place and you don't really know about a place, it's hard for you to take everything you can from it. So I guess that would kind of be my, you know, if I could do it over again, it might be nicer to have more time. Yeah. In- yeah. I think that is something I can relate with as well, you know, because I, I I had a friend who was a, a vet in the Serengeti and I visited him and he, they do, when you're a vet in the Serengeti, you do two year cycles and I visited him only for two weeks. And and I think that was one of the things I, I wish I could have experienced through his lens where you're there for two mm-hmm. years to really experience like the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, Is that one of the most beautiful places on earth? The Serengeti. It's so, yeah. I mean, I, it's one of those places where, where I don't think you can really fully describe Mm -hmm. to anyone, you know, and it's so vast. And, and um, we were there, we we, um, saw the migration of the wildebeest, which was quite amazing. But um, my, this is an interesting story that my father's mom, my grandmother, um, Parker passed away when we were in the Serengeti and it never rains in the Serengeti and it rained for like five minutes and um, I'll never forget my guide and he was like it's for your grandmother <laughs> I was just so touched <laughs> but yeah it, it, what's so amazing about the journey is I have little anecdotes that I remember from almost everywhere yeah isn't that awesome? Like just, it's so easy. We, I think it's it's through these experiences you realize how easy it is to connect with someone. You yeah. Know? But also I think for, for the listeners, I would say, I think that you learn more about a place and yourself. If you go to places that are on the extreme, 
that are not, you know, anybody, if, if you have a certain amount of money, you can fly to a capital city and you can stay in a nice hotel and do all the predictable things. But my most amazing adventures and encounters were in the places that it's, it's a real bitch to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you know, that's why I say sometimes it's maybe you choose a country and you rent a car and you drive around that country because you're just going to learn so much. And yes, I want everybody to go to the museums and, you know, meet, eat at, you know, the nice restaurant and all that kind of stuff. Cause many people have that on the bucket list, but the real meaningful, like, you know, make the hair on your arms stand up kind of moments are probably not going to be in those places. Yeah. Live in the extremes. I like that. Yeah. So one of those quotable quotes. Maybe. <laughs> so last question. And it's, it's this is, you know, something I personally want to know as well is, you know, what did this trip really teach you about life that no other experience could? I think the number one would be that education, in my opinion, is this is the answer to the problems we have in the world. And and so many kids are not being educated. And that's a travesty. Um, I think the trip also taught me how little I know. And so, I mean, I've always had a thirst and I've always been curious, but but now even more so because of um, the people and places that I saw. And I think it helped me to realize that try, try again, which is like a family motto um, we have, is, is the best way to go through life. Um, because, you know, so many people, I, you know, a woman I met in Latvia, you know, she tried a business, it didn't work and she kept trying. And then ultimately, you know, it took off and it's just, we, we, we have to be persistent. And you see so much of that, um, when you're out there in the world. And I guess it just, it pushed me, but I mean, even today at age 52, um, I'm on social media, which, you know, is kind of a, a crazy thing. And I do it because I want to know what's going on. I want to know what my kids are looking at. Um, I want to remain relevant, right? And and um, I just, I don't know if you know about um, uh, Nasser from Nas Daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he has this um, kind of internship going on with uh, Medicoven. He's the one who bought the 69 million uh, NFT. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so it's like a, it's a content creator crypto internship. And so I applied. And my daughters were like, you're insane. Like, mom, you're so old. Like, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and and um, I applied and I'm one of the 70 shortlisted. They had like 7,000 people. We had our first call on Saturday night, people from everywhere in the world. And yes, I am the oldest. But I think that the journey around the world taught me that that's okay. I just need to, to, to push myself, to be true to me, to do what I want, not let anybody tell me I shouldn't do it because it's not what people my age do, you know? And so that trip gave me validation to, to be authentic to me. Yeah. And I guess that's contentment for you, right? Yeah. And I, I really think that if I stayed in my little town or even if I stayed in New York and didn't do that journey, I'm not sure I would be the woman I am today. Yeah. I really don't think I would be. Yeah. Do you, totally off topic, but do you think if you hadn't met Jim, you would have done an, a, a trip like this? No way. He was absolutely the catalyst. Yeah. You know, I, my idea of crazy was like driving in a Jeep across America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I backpacked through Europe when I was in college. Um, you know, I, I, I had a thirst to do, but um, there's, there's no way. And a lot of people say, but you guys have, you know, the money so you can take off for three years and you can do this trip. But there are countless nomads out there who are not doing it in a car 
you know, they're doing it on motorcycles or they're these crazy people who get a car from Europe and drive it down um, to Africa, sell the car, make enough money so they can travel for a while and go back. You know, so there are, there are all kinds of people who have a thirst for adventure and, and find a way to do it. But would I have been to 116 countries and have a Guinness World Record if not for Jim? I hate to say it, but probably not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure money helps, but so does resourcefulness, you know? Yeah. We do see so many people. I think that's one of the, uh, one of the things I found out as well, you know, when I was in South America, I, I did meet someone who was, who was traveling the world by bike. And then when he had to cross oceans, he just took a fish, a fishing boat essentially. So yeah, I guess you really, I mean, if, if the heart is set, then you really find a way, right? <laughs> And maybe for listeners, it's not travel. Maybe the passion is something else. Maybe the passion is 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 going to Africa and building schools, or maybe it's you know becoming a doctor so that you can, um, you know, help children in some way. I mean, I it's not travel for everyone, but I think um, for us to to figure out the passion and follow it is is pretty darn important. Yeah, true. So on, on that note, you know, like especially. Since you you speak about education, you, you know you're working on many things that that is about educating people. What are you currently working on? Well, um, the podcast I'm gearing up for season two, and um, I have some great people. I have um, Violet Un coming on, and I have um, Love Benito, Rachel uh, Lem coming on. Um, I have. Um, the head of DBS, uh, Piyush Gupta. Uh, he, he was a tough one, but I persisted and he's finally agreed. <laughs> I'm building season two and I'm working on this um, internship. I'm trying to, to learn everything I can about crypto, cryptocurrencies, NFTs. So if any listeners hear this and you want to send some links to me to help in my research, I'd greatly appreciate it. So Because it's just so much information out there. I know. Um, I'm thinking that my theme for my videos might be, I know this to be true because like with the crypto world, what do you know to be true? Right. Yeah. But anyway, I'm working on that and uh, my daughter's getting ready to graduate from boarding school. So I will go to England in July and then she's going to Columbia in the fall. So maybe I will be able to go to the U S and see my parents. I haven't seen them in a year. Oh, okay. I'm working on the board for United Women Singapore, and we have uh, many programs going on. And one that I love is about empowering the young boys in school. Um, it's you know a male empowered course so that they understand that the girl is just as good as the boy. Because I think that's a big um, problem is that we keep thinking it's about women holding up half the sky, but if we don't have the male allies and advocates pushing for the equality of women, it's, it's, I mean, I think statistics over a hundred years before we reach, reach, um, equity and parity. Yeah. So also work, working with the Asian civilizations museum. Um, I am a big supporter of local, um, fashion and the arts, and they have a wonderful, uh, exhibition opening up at the end of June which is going to have um, Singapore fashion designers in it, which will be very, very exciting. And uh, many things. Many yeah. things on, on. You, weren't, you weren't kidding when you say you're involved in a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. I love it. You have to spend your energy on things that matter, and those things matter to me. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, Paige, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much for for sharing your story. Uh, I'll put the link to, to your book and your podcast in the descriptions as well. Um, yeah, hopefully people... I have a question for you. Yeah, tell me, ask me. Why did you start your podcast? Well, oh, it's, a, it's a bit of... Um, I guess, I guess the, the summarized version was, you know, because I initially had uh, went through like about 10 years plus of clinical depression. And so... On the back of it, you know, once I became better and, you know, I was ready to, to kind of give back to the world, um, you know, I wanted to find a medium where I could kind of pay it forward just as a thank you for all the people who helped me. And so now I realize like, oh, OK, I have an opportunity to do the same for others. Um, so, yeah, I decided to to tell stories of 
people who live life differently or maybe similarly, but in a way that gives people a bit of comfort and confidence to pursue the things they want to pursue as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of started. But at first, it was like, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I want to be this like famous podcaster. But now I realize it's more for me, you know, I get most out of it. So, you know, win-win. Well, I love that answer. Great respect for you. Thank That's- you. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's 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 quite a it's it's been quite a journey, you know. I've met great people. You're one of them. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. It really it means a lot. It really does. It's my pleasure and I love talking with you. Yeah. Thank you.